All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the best webcast in the entire world. <laughs> Michael's making a goofy face, even though it's like that when he's not making a goofy face. Um, the, web, the webcast just got a lot better because Kevin from Unbiased America isn't with us today. and We got a lot of viewer feedback and said he was quite annoying and unsightly. So our show will run probably a little bit more smoothly this time. Um, we're going to have a few topics. We're probably going to ad lib a few of them, and we're going to take some viewer questions. So if you guys have questions, get them ready and ask. And the child prodigy, Matt Palumbo, will be happy to answer every single one of them. Um, I also want to announce here Matt Palumbo's candidacy for uh, of the Republican Party for president in 2016. So if you have any donations, please send them to his dorm room at uh, you know the College of New Jersey at Trenton. Uh, we'd all appreciate that. Um, you have to send. You actually have to send them to his parents because oh, he's not old enough to accept that's donations yet. Yeah. Good point, Michael. So it must be filtered through his folks like. first, who will skim off the top. And then, just like the government does, they'll skim off the top of the money and then give them whatever they see, you know, that they see fit. Yeah, you can, if you want to uh, help you raise money, you can buy either of these. And um, I've sold <laughs> tens of I've sold tens of them so far. So any any little bit help. I can't do it. I can't forget what I can. Oh no, one bucks. So dozens. Yeah. You can find them on Amazon.com. They're thir I think they're thirteen dollars, right, Matt? Like thirteen or fifteen fluctuates for some reason. You may want to you may want to engage in some economic principles here and perhaps lower the price to in, to stimulate demand. I you may could. sell two copies of them. <laughs> anyway, buy his books. Also, I always forget to man mention you know follow Being Liberal Logic on Facebook. We are capitalists on Facebook, which is a great page, even though the admins are a little bit weird and they eat too much. Well, one of them does. And follow Being Classically Liberal. Unbiased America, which is also a good page. Don't tell Kevin I said that. And The Analytical Conservative, which also has a really great uh, corresponding blog. Anyway, I want to talk about the Oscars. This was this was a big deal this week. Obviously, you know, we'll get into the fact that people were talking about politics and economics there, people that have no clue what they're talking about. But I want to start with American Sniper. I don't, I mean, people care about this. I, I don't watch the Oscars. I, I never have. I know a lot of people love it. Um, I don't, I don't see what the, what the big deal is. But what do you think, do you, Michael? You saw American Sniper today. Do you think it deserved an? Was it Oscar worthy to you? Do you care? What do you think? Well, I mean, I saw, I saw the movie today because I hadn't had a chance to till now. But I liked it. Whether or not it's Oscar worthy, I, I couldn't tell you because it's the only movie I've seen in the theater in the last like year and a half. Mm -hmm. So well. Uh, no, I, I'd like it, though. Let me rephrase. So, Let me rephrase. I don't know if they got snubbed. Let me rephrase. You know how sometimes you'll watch a movie, and you may relate to this. Like, I watched I watched Saving Private Ryan in the movie theater, and I thought, that's going to win an Oscar. You know what I mean? I saw – there's some movies, and you just – this is Oscar worthy. If it doesn't win one, this is crazy. Did you have that same intuition about American Sniper, or did you just think it was a good film in general? I, I thought maybe that it had a chance to win some awards just because I thought Bradley Cooper – did a much better job of portraying Chris Kyle than I ever thought he could possibly do. So in that sense, yeah, I was like, okay, that was pretty spectacular. But other than that, I really, I mean, yeah, I'm not a very good film critic. I'm, I'm the worst person ever to ask that question. Okay. <laughs> um, do you think, though, it is a film that, like, the, you know, that liberal Hollywood may snub? I mean, it did make $300 million at the box office. We had this movie called Birdman. I don't know what that is. I never even heard about it. I thought Michael Keaton had died 10 years ago. So I don't know what Birdman is. I don't know what these other films were. But do you think it's likely that liberal Hollywood could have snubbed American Sniper? Oh, yeah, I definitely think that's likely because you heard about the liberal outrage that was happening when this movie came out. And now that I've actually had a chance to actually watch the entire thing and not just read about it, yeah, I mean, I don't know what liberals are so caught up about it. To me, it was almost an anti-war movie. It showed a lot of the pain and suffering and some of the realities of war that these guys go through. And I think that was an important part, too, is that it's not just about Chris Kyle. Uh, Chris Kyle, they, they make the movie so that you see what soldiers in general go through, and they portrayed that story through Chris Kyle. Right. And I think that in the end, it was actually an anti-war message. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why liberals thought it was a, you know, some sort of, to American horn, I mean, patriotism, war on terrorism justifying message. I didn't, I didn't get any of that from the movie. So 
but yeah, they were up in arms about it regardless. So yeah, I, I could see them snubbing it on purpose like that. Right. I, and I, yeah, I get you. And I mean, any movie, if you're going to make an honest movie and or an honest film on war, it's going to come off as an anti war film. War's, war is a horrible thing. War is hell, right? If you're going to portray it, you're going to portray it as hell. It's not going to be some, you know, glorious thing. I don't know. I mean, certainly contemporarily, maybe I, I, it, the Audie Murphy movie even d depicted it as a, to hell and back. I mean, that was in the in the late was it early 50s? Perhaps early 50s. I don't remember. But if you're going to portray it honestly, it's going to come off as anti-war. The real question is whether war is necessary or not. Yeah, you, and you're you're with me on that, Michael. You're going to portray if. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I am, and I, I think too if you if if war is portrayed right in a film, and I think they did a decent job in this film, then it's going to make it's going to make the brutal realities of war known to people, and it's it should make you not want to go to war if you if you if you put it on the screen accurately. And I think they did a decent job in this movie. Right. No, I. Um, what do you think, Maddie? Did you, you did you watch the movie for one? Yeah, I saw that. Are you old enough to get into that movie? Uh, okay. which American Slaver? Yeah, is it rated R? Do you have to, sh do you have so, to brandish yeah. your ID to get in there? Oh, okay. Uh, no, no, well, I had to have a parent accompany me. <laughs> <laughs> the same parents that funnel off your presidential donations. I get yes, it. Yes, yes. But go ahead. So anyway, my, my, uh, my, lead, my guardian and I did enjoy the film a lot. Uh, I also saw Birdman and thought it was good. I did like American Slamber more. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't watch the Oscars. My understanding is that American Slamber lost in some category to Birdman, but I don't know the details. I don't know what what is for. Birdman? I don't, what, can you tell me what this it's Birdman a, is? I, I have no... It's a movie about a play. Is it like a... I keep thinking Bird Cage whenever I... You know what I mean? That movie with uh, uh, Robin Williams and... <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't see you it know? again. I mean, it was decent, uh, but I wouldn't see it again. So. Oh, so it wasn't... It was okay? It was okay. I mean, it was about a guy who was like... Like, but look, he, his character was famous in the past, and now he's like a playwright, and he's trying to get, you know, become famous again, and then he meets Ed Norton, and it begins to go well. Oh, so, okay, I'll probably, yeah. I'll probably never watch that, okay, but yeah, I just want to say for the record that, my, that Michael Keaton was one of the better Batman, so I'm just saying. I yeah. mean, oh, I think he might be the, the best Oscars? ever. Speaking of the Oscars, I did see uh, John Legend said something, like, I think his claim was that, like, there are more blacks today in prison than there were in slavery, so I did like 13 oh, seconds God. of Google searching, and um, the black population today is greater than the entire U.S. population the year slavery was abolished. So I think that may uh, explain the, the numerical imbalance, but that's just my take. I mean, these guys are <laughs> no, no. Go, Mike. We have. I know you have something to say, Mike. But go ahead. Uh, I just you know it's. I mean, obviously, on the surface, like anybody that's seen like the population numbers could tell that that's just a fallacious argument. Doesn't make any sense. Why would you make that argument? But right. yeah, I mean, yeah, if if the the black population, it would be interesting to see if someone could see the ratio of uh, of how many blacks, the percentage of blacks that are enslaved Versus, are that are in prison, and compare that. No, I mean it's well, yeah, I mean, right to even draw with population increase. Yeah, draw a comparison happen. between the two is nutty, right? I don't know. They keep bringing up slavery constantly, all the time. Uh, you know, uh, enough of that now. We, we fought a war. We lost seven hundred thousand people, and it almost it almost destroyed the republic. It was a horrible institution. You know what I mean? Why don't they talk about the Great Society? Uh, that's awful too. Look what that's done. Anyway, moving along. Um, we had, not only was that one political comment, um, again, there was also, I think they were complaining that not enough, like, people are, not enough people with a darker skin pigmentation are selected for, for Oscars or something. So I think that yeah, was I mean, one of the, the themes there. What, am I wrong? What, is that what happened? I don't know. Like, I remember, um, this wasn't the Oscars in particular, but I remember, like, I saw some article on the Huffington Post, and it was like, so I think the stat... Like, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think they were claiming that, like, 80% of people who appear on, like, Sports Illustrated covers are white, and that's, like, shows how racist we are as a country. And then, like, someone pointed out that, like, 80% of our population is white, and that explains the disparity. So, oh I mean, God. I think the reason there are so many white people winning these awards is because most people in the country we live in are white. 
Like, if white people are winning most of the awards in Ireland, I don't think we should be surprised. Right. I don't under. I just don't get this. I don't get this thing with the race. Uh, it's a con. The slavery thing. Every human being, every every ethnicity of human being has been enslaved. One million uh, slave uh, uh, European slaves were enslaved in Northern Africa between yeah. 1500 and 1800. Uh, there were white slaves being traded long after slavery was uh, died here in the Middle East and in Africa. I mean, what do we? Sure it was never an institution built on race. It was built on economics. Actually, uh, it became economical it to very, buy them from from Africa. There was but, a very comparable amount of white and black slave owners too in the uh, course. Civil War South. Yeah, in yeah. the yeah. South. It was sure. actually very. It was mm -hmm. almost one for one. So. But you can't say that because that'll destroy the narrative. That it was, you know, it's actually it's the all, South that came up with this. Go it's ahead. also racist to point out. So, right, racism yes. didn't start until the South saw that it was a dying institution, and they were trying to protect it as best they could. So they said, "Oh, these cheat. They can't learn. They can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just try. They didn't. You know. So I mean, here, that's where that came from. It was never built on it, and in and, and, and of itself, there were Irish slaves. We can talk about that all day. I, I don't even. I can't. Talking about it bothers me now. Um, but we also had Rosanna Arquette, who is a noted economist. And political scientist, I, and she seems to know she seems to know the personal preferences of every individual in the United States of America. And I think she did. She use the number seventy-seven percent that women. No, she or did she just say that? I don't think she so. didn't explicitly okay. give any stats. She just said it's time for wage equality or something like that. Now, I mean, I worked with We Are Capitalists, and we did a podcast on this. We Are Capitalists has a podcast. We worked on this one. I don't know. I know you did. You wrote about this, didn't you, Matt? Did you do a piece on this? On her claim in particular, or just a wage gap in general? No, this. The president made the claim a, year, a, a while back, over a year ago. He had a speech that women make seventy-seven cents on the dollar. Um, and I remember at the time, just off the top of my head, thinking, if these women make only seventy cents on the dollar of what a man makes, why are these evil oh. capitalists that are just trying to maximize profits hiring any men? Hire women. I'd hire all yeah. women for 70 cents in the dollar and increase my profits. So things just didn't add up right from the get-go. Um, yeah, Mike, exactly. I think... Let me, I think let me start with Mike. Okay, start with Mike. Well, let me start with Mike here, and then I'll get you, Maddie. I know you wrote something on this, but Mike, what do, yeah. what do you think of this claim, and where has she gone wrong? Well, I think the funny thing is, and this this is true in a lot of different de the debates that we have in the political arena, is... I think it's something like – I don't know the exact number, but the debate is over. Most economists don't even take this claim seriously at all. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's in the economics profession knows that this claim has totally been debunked several times. There's different factors, and it basically boils down to the fact that choices have had a greater impact on pay than anything else. If women made more choices to go into engineering and business and stop having babies, the, the gap would – almost completely disappear and some studies show that when you control the, for those factors women make more than men so, so uh, it's it's been thoroughly debunked multiple times and the only arena that it ever gets any attention is the political arena are you saying that women have babies Mike is that what you said that's I'm not sure uh, liberals like to talk a lot about science and since I'm not a liberal and I don't know anything about science apparently maybe they oh, could inform me if women have babies or not I don't know how that works that's the most misogynistic thing I've ever heard is that women have babies okay so can you please tone down the misogyny God it's this it's the white males right. like us that make women have babies okay it's our fault and the reason that they do this is that, or not pick these high you know engineering jobs and these jobs that take up a lot of their time is because of their white male husbands that force them to stay at home and cook food and stuff. Didn't you? You didn't know that? I know. The numbers don't back that up at all, I, but I feel that I, way, I, so I win. So shut up, Mike. <laughs> uh, Maddie. As long, as long as you feel that way and you have a, lo a loud voice, you can say anything you I want. I also feel that there's 90 nurse. the nursing industry is 90% women, and I feel that that's the only industry that actually cares about the plight of women. I mean, I don't know the central yeah. – the person who centrally plans – who hires nurses? I, I don't know why they haven't won a Nobel Peace Prize yet. So there's that. Maddie, what do you think about that? The claim that there's you know not equality uh, with women in the marketplace. Um, so I'm actually reading a really interesting book about that that covers the topic. <laughs> um, so the Conscious of a Young Conservative by yeah, Matt Palumbo. Really, 
Google I it. think everyone everyone should probably go out and buy this book. Listen, I say that anyway. So no, but um, there was one stat I did cite that women who've never been married and never have kids earn a dollar and seventeen cents for every dollar a man earns. So I think you can infer from that that it's mainly taking off time to raise children and different than average works. It explains most of the gap. Um, I've seen studies okay. that you can control basically just for hours worked and I don't know what another one is. Hours, hours worked and something else. I think it might be like career Edu- choice. Education. Yes, education. education but... Never married, right? Yeah. Never. It, women make more. Yes. Yes. But to see the thing is you can't. The thing is you can't. Some studies. Right. So you cannot demagogue those stats when you control when you compare apples to apples. Women make more, generally speaking. Um, yeah. So, you know, then again, this goes back to obviously never married. Uh, the likelihood of them to have kids is less. Uh, and the likelihood of them to spend more time in their career, build skills in the marketplace, right, affords them more money. People don't understand, like Michael said, women choose to have babies. Let's say they're in the tech industry. They work with computers, and you take a year, a year or two off, uh, you know, that you lose a lot of uh, uh uh, human capital in those two years, and therefore you co- you command less in the marketplace. And people yeah. don't usually think that men and women make different choices. That somehow men and women are inherently different. I don't know if that's a crazy claim to make. I don't know if I'm a bigot yet, but somebody will probably call me that later. Um, why do you think Hollywood opines on these issues? I mean, here are these people in the lap of luxury. I mean, they made all their money from a system that they sought they 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 claim to despise. Um, I think it's because everyone. I, I don't know. Everyone wants to be like the common man. Like every rich politician tries to act like they're like middle America, and I think Hollywood actors do the exact same thing when they support liberal policies. So, right. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. What do you think, Mike? Like, what are these elitist Hollywood liberals that are make a ton of money off of us, off of Main Street people that go around the people that make these decisions, and then they're going to tell us like you know uh, they they tell us what's good for us or what decision a woman should make. Where do you think they get this uh, this arrogance from, Mike? Well, it's funny. I read a I read a piece about this, and I really wish I could remember who wrote the piece and 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 who dug really deep into this issue. And it slips my mind right now. But the general theory was that Hollywood actors and actresses they never really worked like a businessman or an entrepreneur to make the fortune that they make. They were born with a certain talent that allowed them to become rich. And you know how a lot of liberals hate people that inherit money. They think it's an unfair advantage when you inherit money. Well, people that are talented, whether it's to play basketball or whether it's to act or sing, inherit a talent. And they have an unfair advantage over everybody else at the beginning of their life, too. And the theory goes that since they inherited this talent and never had to actually take risks and figure out their way through the economy, they just kind of sprung their way to the top because they were born that way. They don't really have an understanding of how money and economic principles work. Right. And that was the general theory of why Hollywood becomes so liberal. They almost feel guilty uh, that they've inherited so much talent. Right. I agree. Now, I'm going to ask you guys both a question. Yes. Do you think it's unfair? We'll start with Matt. Do you think it's unfair that NBA players get paid more than WNBA players? I mean, isn't that a clear-cut example of the white patriarchy in the United States of America? Yes. Go ahead, Matt. I mean, how do you how can you refute that? That's I mean, answer. that's just a clear-cut example that men get paid more money than women based on gender. Come on. Oh, I, I said yes. I agree with you. I don't. I wasn't disagreeing. I can't really elaborate. I disagree with you. I, I mean, that's how I feel. I mean, that's so, a hard one really... to. That's a hard one to refute. What do you think, yeah. Michael? Don't you think that they should? I think there's a Lily Ledbetter law. They should pass a law that dictates that in both leagues they should be paid the same amount of money. I think that would improve both sports uh, greatly. What do you think, Michael? I think that you know, if you could prove that 25 percent. Of women could dunk, then we could pursue that policy. <laughs> Misogynist. Anyway, <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I'm glad you guys handled that question quite well. Um, I want to move along now. <clears throat> I want to get out of the Rosanna Arquette stage here. She's just so stupid; it, it hurts. Um, I want to get into the like DHS bill a little bit. Yeah, I know. We're gonna move on to cops. I don't know if anybody saw. 
bourbons and bi bourbon and is it bitches and bourbon or bourbon and bitches? I can't remember. I always I'm dyslexic. But any, dyslexic. But anyway, um, we were talking about cops last night. It got kind of heated. It's pretty good. You can watch that episode. I think it was episode 13 or 14 or something. Um, but we'll get to that later. But I want to start with um, the DHS bill in in the, the bill that was passed by Congress sent to the Senate, which uh, the Democrats are now blocking. My proposal is to get rid of the filibuster, right, so that they, this can come to a vote and they can't block it. Um, what do you think, Mike? Well, I mean, we kind of got in that discussion at the end of the show last week. I don't really necessarily agree with ending the, the filibuster. But I brought this up uh, earlier this week. I, I find it funny that when Republicans use the filibuster, uh, you know, Rand Paul's filibuster and some other examples, you know, Republicans were just, uh, they were just obstructionists. They were just, you know, not letting the country move forward. It's, uh, now that the Democrats have used the filibuster, apparently Republicans are still obstructionists. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, which, <laughs> which one is it? Uh, Democrats are filibustering a bill. A judge has struck down, uh, you know, Obama's, Obama's uh, executive order. So they have no reason to hold up DHS oh, right no. now. It's it's Democrats, if we use their definition of obstruction, that are being obstructionists right now, but yet somehow the narrative has, has claimed that it's Republicans right. that are obstructing. I agree with you, but the thing is that that, that injunction filed by the injunction by the, the, um, by the uh, circuit court judge, the president already said he's not going to abide by it. He's going to go ahead with it anyway. It's really impotent. It's really Congress, and it doesn't really matter what the courts do here. Congress has a constitutional means to defund these things, and the Senate is deferring. Um, now, and now Republicans, too, are jumping on the back of this thing. I just want to make the point that these executive actions are entirely unconstitutional, yet you have the entire Democrat Party getting behind it. Literally, they're getting behind tyranny, I mean, against liberty. And then you have the Republican Party, the GOP now, is trying to defer to the courts. They think people are stupid. I saw McCain and Lindsey Graham on TV saying, you know, oh, we don't want to defund DHS. No, you're not defunding it. Whether you fund it or not, there's, I think, 84% of DHS is deemed essential. So by statutory law, they have to go to work. So they're using our national security as a political football here, saying that, well, you know, uh, if we don't fund it or if we don't, if, uh, you know, if we don't pass this bill or get rid of the, uh, the defunding of his executive actions, we're going to be less safe. I, I can't. I can't believe this stuff. What do you think, Matt? Do you think um, Republicans should fight harder? Do you think they should perhaps remove the filibuster so that they can get more legislation passed to protect the Constitution um, against tyranny? What do you think? Um, now the filibuster, um, yeah, when Republicans do it, it's awesome. Um, when Democrats do it, they're abusing the political system for their own gain. So, pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Based casting, right. I think it's all pro. I think it's, if we had a if we had a Republican Congress that was some guts, I mean, let's get some things done here. You know what I, I mean? I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know much about the bill in question. I don't know what the cuts would be or if they're real cuts. Like, I don't know if they're just cutting projected spending or if they're real cuts. Um, so I don't know. You're just defunding his executive right? action. You're funding everything in DHS except for his executive action, the, the lawless part. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, and then they're calling re Republicans obstructionists. The Democrats won't take it to a vote. It's blatantly okay, unconstitutional. Yeah. Therefore, the it's... Democrats are backing tyranny. Okay. Yeah, right? A, a out, dictator. I just want to point out, too, that about 20 minutes ago, a commenter complained that I only drink one beer a show. So I just want to make an announcement that we are going two for two. You're going two for two? You're, you're double fisting? Two for two. What's up, what was that? Am I going to get a late night text? Am I going to get a late night text about how drunk you are? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never done that before. That's a possibility. <laughs> well, all right. So, I mean, my uh, in my opinion, I think the Republican Party should do whatever's in their power. Getting rid of dismantling the filibuster, getting circuit court judges out there are trying to trying to pass bills to uh, I don't know, to reinstate the constitution, to get back to constitutionalism is entirely fair. Democrats do it to to, to uh, uh, further their cause of tyranny, essentially, to have this all-powerful executive and to centralize uh, to centralize uh, power. I think that Republicans should use whatever in their power, constitutional authority, to dissipate power. What do you think, Mike? I mean, that was a hard lead-in for you to refute, so you can try, but I win. Well, well, 
let me well, let me make one thing clear here. I actually support open borders, but I don't support President Obama's actions right. because President Obama has tried to circumvent his constitutional authority. So I agree with you in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I actually think by doing what he's doing, he's setting aside or he's setting back real immigration reform years because now we have a political battle going on that we didn't have to have. Right. We didn't have to have this battle. Right. So he, he's setting back actual constitutional real reforms back years because he refused to actually go about it the right way. And as someone that supports actual, uh, you know, at, le at the very least, easing restrictions on immigration, if not open borders, I I'm mad about this because, you know, as a Democrat and as someone that says he supports, you know, immigration reform, he set it back maybe a decade by doing right. what he did. So. It's it's unbelievable and and now we now we get to have the debate about presidential authority where I'm going to side with people like you instead of talking about the real issue. Now, here's my question. I want to clarify on open borders. Do you mean open borders insofar as like pre 1914 legislation, or do you mean open borders like just get people don't even have a border checkpoint, just let everybody in? I mean anybody that wants to come in. Ellis Island style so pre can come into the country. I'm, I'm screen them for a criminal record, diseases, yeah, exactly. so on and so forth, right? Yeah, it's kind of like this. And come on in. No, no thousands of pages worth of paperwork and a year of waiting. Show up. You know, as long as you're not a criminal, you know, you can come and you can try to make something of yourself what here. A, I support that completely. How about political radicals? Those that come here that want to, you know, I don't know. They want to change the government through revolution. The original people that... Political radicals were the only people that we had coming here for the longest amount of time. I don't know. At Ellis Island, they would. I don't have a problem with Ellis that. Ellis Island, they didn't let political radicals in. What do you, Matt? What do you think? What do you, what's your stance on immigration? I mean, and uh, considering too, Mike, we have a massive welfare state. Which would be my follow-up question. And by the way, is do you think Democrats want to have open borders because there's a free, free flow to jobs and there's going to be economic growth? I mean, I don't know one Democrat that's ever supported anything that's for economic growth. But what do you think? What do you think, Matt? Me? I mean... And then we'll go back to Mike. Uh, honestly, I think it's very politicized right now. I think the Dems may be supporting more immigration, generally because Hispanics tend to vote Democrat. And... Right. I know. In, in but, are they, but are they here... But, uh, but here's the thing, though. Are those Hispanics, why are they voting Democrat? Is it because they want more economic freedom, free flow to jobs? Is that why they're voting... I mean, is that what it's the Democratic Party stands for? I know. Okay. So I, I honestly do believe that these immigrants who are coming here, who are very low skilled, are doing it to better themselves. I don't think they're doing it for welfare. So I don't necessarily think that that's the reason why because there's a welfare state here that Democrats. Right. I mean, I don't. I don't think I can blanket statement say why they're coming here. I don't really know. I, I mean, better than, uh, some Mexico. may be coming here. Some may be, but anybody's better than Mexico. But yeah. some may be coming here for jobs. I'm sure some aren't. But I don't, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know what the Democrats' motives are. It's certainly not for economic growth. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, um, you know, my whole, my whole immigration stance is kind of like that of Mike's. Like when Corey and I say, you know, we want open borders, we don't literally mean no border. You know, obviously there, there would be a border. Right. It would just be a much more relaxed tour of immigration. There would obviously be controls for, as you right. said, political radicals, uh, people with criminal records, that sort of thing. So. Right. Yeah. The problem now is that we have people coming here. It's it it is open border. We don't know who's coming here. We don't know why. We talk as if a lot of people talk that support open borders. Oh well, they're coming here for jobs. Well, we don't know why they're coming. We don't even know who's here. Yeah. We don't know how yeah. many I mean, people are here. We can't we, control we, the spread of disease. We can't track criminals because they're not right. part of the system. We have no idea. Yeah. The only, right. So the only, I'm just uh, saying. How about? The only silver lining is they don't qualify for welfare because they're not citizens. So No, well, they don't. But the thing is, when you have, because of Wong Kim Ark in 1898, when they come here and have a child, on America, that's, oh, that child kid, becomes yeah. an American citizen, and they're privy to benefits, and they get paid a lot of money, and then they get jobs that are paid cash, and then not only are they subsidized by the government, they make, they make money. I, my family owns restaurants. I've seen it happen. A lot of times. I'm not saying everybody does that. That's not what I'm saying, but it would be good to know who's here before we change any immigration law. Meaning, close the borders, have an Ellis Island type deal. Have yeah. them come through, you screen them, very simple, you come here, no, you do not get any benefits, I don't care where your kid's born, and you get a job. 
it, that's free flow. That's a free flowing uh, a labor market, right? Mike, go ahead. Uh, well, I just I'm kind of confused, Will, because uh, as far as I've known, that you've always been a disciple of Friedman, and a lot of conservatives they invoke Friedman when it comes to immigration. But what a lot of people miss is Friedman actually supported illegal immigration, right. bec precisely because illegal immigration benefits the economy because immigrants come here to work. That's been proven, no, well, it may but they can't soak up welfare. It may benefit the economy, but let me, but personally, for me, that's fine and all. I don't. I, I think immigration benefits the economy, so I would rather to avoid things like crime, the things that you're worried about, let them come right. in legally. Because immigrants have been shown, and studies have shown, immigrants use welfare at way lower rates than natives use it. They start way more businesses. They work jobs immigrants aren't willing to work. You're about, and the only time you're going to run into this pro You're talking about legal immigration. Now, those are stats on legal immigrants. And moreover, those are people coming here with skills. Right. Well, talking about low-skilled immigrants that come here and don't have the no, means to start a business. Even low-skilled immigrants. I mean, if you had read Corey and Matt's book in defense of classical liberalism, they cite multiple studies that show even low-skilled immigrants are way more entrepreneurial than natives. And they start businesses to actually create more jobs and generate more revenue than they use in I'm welfare. Curious to know how they and that's the, this, I'm curious uh, to know how they receive business licenses without being a citizen. I think he said about legal. Oh, we're talking about legal well. We're talking about legal right, immigration so here. That's, that's, that's what I'm talking totally about. That's a totally separate issue. I'm, you're not going to get an argument from me there. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about them coming here, illegal, low-skilled immigration. I'm totally fine with it. So long as we know who's coming here, fine. I don't want political radicals here. I don't want criminals here. I don't want people carrying drug-resistant strains of TB here. I don't want people bringing Ebola here. We've, we've destroyed third-world viruses. Why do we want... We don't want those things here. So if they're screened, I'm totally fine with opening the borders. I t totally fine opening it in the sense that we know who's here pre-1914. I'm saying we don't know who's coming here. We have, we don't know if they're all from Mexico. For one, they're from the cent. We we saw that there was a hundred thousand people on the border, women and children that they had that were just pouring over from uh, Central America. They weren't even, they weren't Mexican. How many of these people? How, where do we know they're coming? Are they coming from perhaps the Middle East? Where are they going? They're not coming through Canada. I don't know. So it would be just good to know who's going. The only, and Friedman did say as long as it's illegal. The only, but you cannot have you cannot have immigration to welfare. You cannot have a movement from uh, to welfare. And that's been what's happening. And if you read the CIS, they talk about how much that they are the largest beneficiaries of welfare. If you look at FAIR, FAIR says that they cost California yearly $25 billion. And people say, well, they pay into the system. Well, somebody would be working those jobs anyway, paying into the system without costing it money. They use resources, ambulance, police, hospitals. Uh, you know what I mean? We don't even know who's using it. That's my point. That's, I, I, you, that's all I'm saying. They're not really, and they're not contributing as close to as much yeah, as they I cost. Mean, Go ahead, Mike. I, I, I agree with you. One of the drawbacks of illegal immigration is the fact that you can't track who's coming. Right. And when you can't track who's coming, you don't. No idea. You know that that presents a lot of different issues, and you you could make the argument that even if they are economically beneficial, that the other drawbacks outweigh those things. Right. So that's why, to me, that's even a more compelling argument to make sure that we have eased legal immigration strategies so that we can get those economic benefits right. that free moving human capital brings that's, without dealing with some of the drawbacks of illegal immigration. We don't have the framework put forth for it to maximize benefits to our economy, to American citizens that are already here. That's kind of my point. It's that the system we have now does not work at all to that end. Henceforth, why the Democrats support it. They're not, Democrats aren't really about, well, let's, you know, let's build that economy, you know, global warming and, uh, you know, and if people can, you know, if people work on their own and they're making money, well, you know, they're going to want to support the Democrats because, you know, more government helps people that can s sustain themselves. N not really. Matt, what do you think? About what illegal immigration? Or yeah, I mean, what do you I, again? And I think Sowell makes the argument: abstract immigrants in an abstract world. Um, uh, I, I, Mike and I are to in total agreement here. By the way, I want to have pre nineteen. I just close the border I mean, and I get pre nineteen fourteen laws. Simple and get rid yeah, of the welfare I, state. That, I think I'm very much in agreement with you guys. Um, there was an interesting statistic I read recently that 
I think it's that like for every immigrant or illegal immigrant we deport, it costs on average something like ten thousand dollars. So I mean, based off that stat, do you think maybe some sort of amnesty to let's say uh, legalize illegals who may qualify or meet your criteria would be appropriate? No, no I, here's the thing about that. You can't even talk about it until you close the border. Right. You obviously. could close the border, say, give them all amnesty, cut them off from, you could do that, but you yeah. cannot create incentives for more people to come here. We saw that happen this past summer. I mean, when they heard first, that, oh, amnesty might pass, and they just flooded across. And yeah. we had this humanitarian crisis on the border. They're refugees, and they're sleeping I mean, in little boxes. A very sad fact is what? that a, uh, a significant portion of our border fence was built using illegal immigrant labor. So, well, here's the thing: the fence that they were built that was that was a law passed, I think, in 2006, never enforced. I think they only built 30 miles of it, and then yeah, stopped it, building it. I mean, there's a get them alive. It's law. It's complete lawlessness on the border. It's yeah. absolute. No one's following the law. So if you do whatever immigration law you do pass, no one's going to follow it anyway. The politicians only first. care about their political ends. Yeah. They're fighting over a Hispanic vote that I think makes up, what is it, less than 10% of the total vote? I think it's even yeah. less than that. Yeah. Um, and this is what they're, this is what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, but they're trying to establish themselves for the future. Right. No, I exactly. They know that the his Right. You're right. You nailed it. Go ahead, Mike. Well, yeah, that, that's all I was going to say is, you know, it's a small percentage right now, but it's going to grow, and it, it won't ever grow to a majority probably, but the percentage is going to continue to grow. So they're trying to establish a base sure. is basically what they're trying no to do. No doubt about it. Both of them are doing it. I mean, look, Bush was in office when that bill passed to build the fence. It's his job to execute the law. He didn't do it. I mean, that's just one of the instances. That guy was a terrible president too. I could get into that all day. <laughs> but, um, I mean, moving – okay. I want to talk to you about this anyway, Mike. Um, we were talking about this, and we talked about it briefly, uh, Rand Paul and his audit the Fed movement. Um, you have some inf interesting information on that, and I want you to disseminate it here so people can understand what's really going on. Can you tell us? Well, I, well, I don't know where to start. I don't, I don't understand the point of audit the Fed, to be honest with you. I don't get it. I, to me, I think it's just a political ploy because Rand knows it's going to be popular with a certain segment of his voters. That's that's the only thing I think it is. I think what I what I find most hilarious about this is that libertarians are the most adamant supporters of the audit of the Fed. Well, why would libertarians want this institution, as in the federal government, to have more influence over something that they don't have that much influence over right now? Right. Why would you want the federal government to be involved? Right. Here's here's some just just an example of what could happen. If the Fed, if if Congress and the and the federal government has more control over monetary policy because the Fed is is bending to political will, you could have you could potentially have a democratic controlled you know Congress that we had back when Obama first got office that starts doing things like monetizing the debt, you know, and then they're going to they're going to use fiscal stimulus <laughs> and uh, that's going to run run away inflation. After they after they pay for that by by printing more money, and that's the kind of things that you could see happen if you let government control the Fed. I I, I don't understand. I mean, I I could talk about it all day. There's more there's more reasons than that that I disagree with this. For instance, what are they going to gain by by what 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 is the point that they're going to gain? Rand Paul said that he wants to find out where they buy the bonds from. Well, the Fed already announced where they buy the bonds from. <laughs> they buy the bonds from the 22 public. Uh, licensed dealers of bonds. Mm -hmm. they, we already know all this information. So why why are we auditing the? I don't get it. The thing about Rand Paul, I like Rand Paul a lot, but he's a populist. I mean, he's. Oh, I, I like Rand Paul. Too, right, he's like. out. This is the thing. I mean, it, does, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that because we support him, he's beyond criticism. But he does these things a lot, where he talks about right. things that have already been done or where he has actually no power. I get it. It's a little bit of demagoguery thrown in there. I just don't like it. We don't really need that. I mean. We have so much – these Democrats are doing so many things that harm this country. Why are you picking audit the Fed? You, you know what I mean? What is it with that? How about let's try, to, let's try to decrease government control over the economy in a broad sense. Pick something more specific like the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Board. Talk about all the things that thing's doing. Why do you got to well, do audit the Fed? Go. Well, and that's, that's hilarious too because Elizabeth Warren, you know, 
who is against big banks, <laughs> she's actually come out against the audit the Fed bill, and she's come she's going to come out of this looking better than Rand Paul. Yeah. Because she knows that, you know, she's taken a political side. She probably doesn't actually know. She's probably been advised to take a certain side on this issue. Right. But yeah, if you went after the, if you went after that, that's her baby. The the financial uh, consumer financial protection bureau. That's Elizabeth Warren's baby. You could turn over those rocks. That would be way more effective than going after the Fed. But Rand Paul's going after the wrong animal here. And right. I, I I mean, it's a political ploy. I like Rand Paul. I, I'll probably end up supporting Rand Paul, but yeah, I don't understand the audit, the Fed movement. All right, I just want to do this really quickly because Maddie's here, and I just want to take this, which isn't a question, but it's probably the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, and it's more of a statement, and I just want Maddie to, to laugh at it for a little while since he wrote a book called In Defense of Classical Liberalism. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from, from, I think it's not a question, but a stupid statement from Francis McCloskey, I think is the whole name. This is, this is classic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, classical liberals are phonies. They are not liberal. <laughs> Maddie, can you please explain why that might be the dumbest thing you've ever heard in your entire life? Go. Oh, I mean, his statement's completely correct. I don't know why you're bringing this up, Will. <laughs> I mean, when you hear classical liberalism, do you think contemporary liberalism or modern liberalism? Well, but let's, Mike. What do they call? What What do they call? Say well, uh, well, the equivalent of the too, conservative. Well, Go it's ahead. Way too, it's way too hard to Google the term classical liberal. I don't know why you're holding Francis up to that standard. So. No, that's totally true because li the word liberal. I mean, you know, was well, always liberal, for was a people right Marxist. Yeah. Yeah, it was always liberal means Marxist. Uh, Mike, what do they call like uh, you know the contemporary version of say conservatives or liberty-minded folks in Europe? Oh yeah. Uh, anybody like anybody in Europe that would be liberty-minded or what we would call libertarian in the United States is called a liberal. Here. Oh my God! No. In Europe, it's a, you're kidding. Europe, liberals and what would be the modern equivalent of the American liberal or the modern left in the United States are usually called social democrats or something. Like, like that. I just want to point out the liberal. He said, are you sure you're just not a phony liberal? That could be possible, too. I might be. I just want to point out, though, that, I'm not gonna say on that the show. Francis, uh, he put a period at the end of the sentence and made a declarative statement, so therefore both of you are wrong. And he did so on he did so on the interwebs, so that makes you double wrong. Okay? Oh, um, uh, I, uh, I overheard you guys talking about the Fed when I was coming back. I don't know, Mike probably made the point, but did he make the point that the Federal Reserve is already audited by, like, at least two different agencies? I'm sorry. I didn't make that point. You didn't make that point? Yeah. Okay. No, I didn't even Okay, yeah, no, that. the, the uh, Government Accountability Office audits the Fed, and there's also private firms that audit the Fed. And um, actually, the last uh, hearing Janet Yellen spoke at, she brought a copy of the 2013 uh, Federal Reserve audit with her as proof that we audit the Fed. Right. Yes. Um, just looking through the, some of the questions here, and I'm not paying attention to anything Matt says, which is probably a good idea. Um, huh. Let's see. Let me take this one, even though I can't read the whole thing. Can you guys read that? Yeah. If a president can just have to press show more. From John King, who I know, a buddy of mine. Let's see. If a president can decide uh, we don't yeah. have the resources to enforce federal immigration laws, why can't a president decide we don't have the resources to enforce Obamacare laws, or for that matter, say corporate tax laws? That's a pretty good <laughs> question. <laughs> That's a pretty good question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, Matt? You, Matt, you answer that since you're, you're our domestic policy expert. Yeah. And you, and you wrote two books, one called In Defense of Classical Liberalism. And the other one, I, Conscience of a Young Conservative, answer that question. Yeah, just in case anyone didn't hear, the titles were uh, The Conscience of a Young Conservative and In Defense of Classical Liberalism. Moving on. Yeah, no, the, um, the cost of Obamacare is in the trillions. The cost of immigration reform is would be nowhere near that. I think you could argue it would actually save money for immigration reform. So, yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, I hopefully, hopefully the next president can decide we don't have the uh, resources to enforce Obamacare. 
Well, you know, Michael, what do you think? I mean, uh, on that question, is it mainly a political issue? It's like, well, we don't have the resources. I mean, do politicians tell the truth? Or are they mainly motivated by political uh, uh, by political motives? Go. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that it's definitely a political issue. And I think that John's simple question does a great job of, in a couple sentences, calling out the exact hypocrisy of the problem. Yeah, it's a completely a political issue. It's not anything to do with government funds or economic issues. It's what you can get away with saying that'll fool people and let you get votes. That's all it is. Right. And, and just to a point here, first of all, the president doesn't decide what resources we do have. I mean, he could decide what resources he has, certainly in the executive branch. But the thing is, Congress decides where resources go. So my problem is we have a feckless Congress that can just defund Obamacare, but, you know, poor John McCain doesn't want to get blamed for it. So, you know, the Constitution should really be usurped and violated by the judiciary and the executive because John McCain's scared he may get blamed by protecting it. These people piss me off. Okay, let's look, <laughs> let's look through some more questions. John McCain, really, that guy kills me. And Lindsey Graham, the way he talks, is, is, it's awful that nose nasally thing and he has no clue what he's talking about he actually makes bill o'reilly look smart that's pretty bad um i actually donated to the uh to uh lindsey graham's primary opponent oh really yeah oh here we go I, but uh it didn't work out he was he was really good <laughs> francis Mas uh, i gotta put this on we can let's talk about this <laughs> will screw you you scumbag <laughs> now, let's debate for like a half a second why I am a scumbag. Um, <laughs> Mike, go ahead. Why are you such a scumbag, Will? Well, that's a good question. Well, uh, you, Will, you, you, you're a, you're a liberal in the classical sense, I would say, aren't you? I would say so. I'm, I'm a liberal, which means that I'm sense. really just on Francis's so team. You, 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 you <laughs> prefer personal freedom. Uh, without government interference, right? Uh, no, I'm a classical. No, I I want a government is the answer to every single problem. Therefore, I'm a liberal. Right. Yeah. Well, what I'm what's that shirt that you're wearing right now? My shirt. See? Yeah. Total liberal shirt. Oh. Right. Huh. Obey government. Scumbag. Obey gotta, government. Yes. So, I'm gonna tax it yeah, there you go. Will's <laughs> a scumbag. Oh, this is a good. <laughs> that came in Let's see. Shirt. I'm glorifying tax evasion. Oh, I gotta use this guy again. I, this guy is priceless. He's a treasure trove of, of 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 BS. Here we go. This is why I hate John McCain. Francis again. Our lovable know nothing. Senator McCain is one of the country's greatest Republicans. I need I say any more, fellas? So why don't you vote for him? Do I have to say? <laughs> do I need to say anything more about? John McCain, he just, he, thank you so much, Francis. You're a great man for summing that up. You know, I didn't you know, even well, have to do it. Well, I'm sure he was saying the exact same thing in, during the 2008 election. Right, exactly. No, yeah, he. I'm sure he turned out for him. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, he's called me a fool. I've been called a fool, but not one argument from also Francis. That sounds like a real, that sounds like a, sounds like a contemporary liberal to me. Um... You ever don't... Here, this is a good one for Matt. I like this one. You there we go, Matt. Jared. Asked... Um, it has happened on a few occasions. Yes, I can't remember the exact issues, but I do remember, like when I was when I was writing my books, uh, there would be multiple cases where I'd do a ton of research into something and then realize I had no argument. So I can't actually remember any yeah. specific cases right now, but it has happened before. How about you, Mike? You do a lot of research. Yeah, there's actually two. There's actually two instances where this has really happened to me. Uh, when I first started studying economics, uh, I was actually one of those people that was really in favor of the gold oh, standard. Yeah. I thought that was the way that we had to go, and I had that preconceived notion. So when I actually started really doing research on the topic, I came away, you know, realizing that actually the gold standard uh, would not be the most desirable desirable idea. And then the second thing that I would say where my preconceived notions have been challenged is foreign policy. Uh, for a while I was a strict non-interventionalist, but I've realized that there's probably a role, especially for the most powerful country in the world, to play 
in foreign affairs. It doesn't have to be, you know, invading Iraq every 10 years as we've done, but there's probably a role for the United States to play and even militarily in foreign affairs. And those are those those would be the two issues that I would say that my preconceived notions have been challenged. Wow. Yeah. Now here's the thing from that's a great yeah, go, that's a great question. Let me just I'll, I'll get you in here, Matt. I just want to see our motive. I think oh, it's the I motives was behind say the gold standard was why, the same with me. But go on. Okay. Uh, the motives behind why we do research, and I mean we're all on the show because we do a ton of research and we write and, and people read it. And I mean a lot of the times I don't really go in with a preconceived notion. I hear something that somebody says. And it will piss me off. And it's like, well, you know, that can't be true or that can – is that true? I don't know. It's the fact that I don't know about it that really fires me up and makes me research. So I rarely go in with a preconceived notion. I don't know. Are you similar in that, in that sense, Matt? You know, like, it, it's that, hard to say. Is that why you did your Gruber piece? We, we all like to think we're unbiased, but I, I, I don't know. I do like to think I'm unbiased, but obviously I do have that, that right word till obviously when I'm doing research. Um, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, right. but listen, if I see a source that's not from dailycoast.com that contradicts something I say, and it's, I, I'll look into it. I'll, uh, I don't know, I, I look at right. a lot of different opinions. I want to know, I want to know it's true. I don't really care that much about ideology, so. Exactly. I mean, look, I learned a lot about deflation from Paul Krugman. Yeah. I don't think any, I should tell anybody that probably. But I mean, um, I, it's true. I mean, yeah, I didn't understand really why lucidly it was bad until I actually read someone on your blog about that, and I, I, I do get it now. But. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's Jacob Westman, who's um, going to school in core economics and math. He's pretty good. Um, Mike, I, I mean, what what make what motivates you though to do the research? Um, insofar as it's related to a preconceived notion, are you thinking, well, this can be true or this can't be true, or do you go into it as? It's not that I have. Uh, the uh, biasy it's just like I want to know the truth I don't know and I go in and I'm not really thinking well this has to be true or this doesn't it's just that I go in and I read certain scholars and I find I find out what is true and if it not only if it is empirically true also is it logical you know what I mean uh, you know so I'll check numerous times to make sure I'm correct what motivates you to do it well I think well before I even uh, you know, when I first started reading about politics and public policy, I wanted to be right. My motivation was to have the right solutions. But to bring it further, when I started running Being Liberal Logic, it was I dealt with and I deal with probably the grandest echo chamber on Facebook. <laughs> so these people are the people that regurgitate whatever anybody's talking point is. And every ideology is guilty of this. Right. It does, libertarians aren't immune. Conservatives aren't immune. Liberals are obviously aren't immune. And for me, it was, do I want to just say exactly what other libertarians are saying because that's what they're saying? Or do I want to actually right. dig deeper and make sure that I have the most, the stance that's most supported by evidence? And I care about evidence. And as Matt said, are we unbiased? No, we all have beliefs. Right. But I try to follow the evidence and not the ideology. All right. I, by the way, I love this Francis guy. He's awesome. Stick around, Francis. We need a good punching bag during the show. Um, <laughs> also, the next question, which is a brilliant a question, that, I mean, compared to compared to Francis's, I don't know. I want to call you Frank. I'm not calling you Francis. Sorry, buddy. Compared to Frank's question, is really brilliant. It's Will. What kind of product do you use for your hair? Is it Garnier? <laughs> um, I don't know if that's how I say that word. I, I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know how to say that. But uh, no, I don't. It's actually just I just combed it. So I don't use anything in there. It saves me a ton of money. Money I don't have. I don't. I barely even eat because I'm so poor. But I'm still a really greedy capitalist. Um, uh, <laughs> Matt, what kind of product do you think I use in my hair? There's something about Mary type product. I was or? thinking. I was thinking L'Oreal, think? but that's the only brand I know, so I can't really. I can't really speak. Or is L'Oreal for your hair, or is that skincare product? Oh, is it? I, I, I don't know. know. I'm only 13 years old. I don't know. I met the owner of L'Oreal one time. She's she's smoking hot. That's nice. Mike, um, yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, it's very cool. What type of product do you use for your hair? I mean, do you use a little wax in there? Are you waxing that? It looks pretty perfect. I use just for men. Just for men? Yeah, I use just for men. Is that to keep it colored yeah. or to, to mold it? I'm only 20. Yeah, it's both. If I wasn't, I mean, I'm only 26, but if I didn't use Just For Men, I'd be completely gray. Yeah. So it, it works perfectly. That's because I'm married. If, if you don't ever want 
to get gray hairs. Don't ever get married. Otherwise, you'll, you will get gray hairs at that point. Right. Right. Nope, you're right. Um, let me see here. Let me see. I don't know. I have a question here. This is interesting. And I, it's probably, I don't know if it's for me. I don't know. But it says, are you still taking that economics professor who is a Marxist? That's uh, Corey. I, and I mean, I post a lot. Is that Corey? I think he's working at Corey, okay. yeah. Do you know about that? Mark, you uh, you know about that? Mark, you heard that on being classically liberal. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually Corey who had that professor, not me. He said it's for Matt. Okay. He says it's it was, for uh, Matt. Corey had a professor, I think it was last semester, but he told me he ended up getting an A in the class. So. He was a full-blown Marxist, though? Yeah, he said uh, he said on the last day the professor emailed him, like, saying you made me think a lot, even though you pissed me off a few times, so congratulations. I mean, I that's okay. I what school is he going to? That's got to be tough to get Those a full blown Marxist. Is he right. sure it was full blown? I mean, that's not even right. I've I've had like my macro teacher was a full blown Keynesian, and I mean just bash conservatives and libertarians whenever he got a chance. I'm in finance. But, I'm in but, finance, um, so there are zero liberals here. Yeah, there's zero, right? Not yeah, more. in finance for sure. But economics, you'll still get. I've never seen, even in liberal departments, you won't get a, it's hard to find a Marxist professor. I mean, they, I don't even know them, I just can't even come up with the methodology Honestly, they finance, would use. In, in finance, the ratio, there's two Republican professors for every one Democrat. In sociology, there's 44 Democrats for every one Republican. So that's how right. three of the ratios are. Right. I don't, yeah. Uh, Michael's about to go, <laughs> he's going to enter the economics department. What school? Uh, Saginaw Valley State. Oh, it's brutal. I'm telling you. It's a Michigan. I'm telling, I have one State. like libertarian. Yeah. I have one libertarian conservative professor, and that's it. And uh, uh, who was in part of the Reagan administration. That's really the only one I have. Actually, uh, um, the other ones school, tend to be. One of the professors at my school does the uh, Learn Liberty videos. Like he's part of the Learn Liberty. Oh. Uh, uh, so uh, I might take well, it. For, uh, he has a class called Philosophy of Law, so I might take that with the next semester. Right. What's interesting, though, is political science departments. I mean, I have this one teacher. I went to his office, and, you know, I, you, you can't really – you could pick up that the guy's a left-wing loon job, right, which is from class, the way he talks about, you know, he's like, oh, capitalism's all about profits. And I said, really? What do you, why, are you, why did you come to school today? Are you working here to work at a loss, or are you here to – you know, I actually raised my hand and said that. Are you trying to come out on top of your – like, what did you get a job – anyway – I walked to his office and he's got Che Guevara all over his walls. You know, I mean, here this guy's, a, you know, he's got a racist, homophobe, mass murderer on his walls. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is, I mean, how do you get away with this stuff? Is, is liberal academia stupid? Are there, are, do they have the same ideological sentiments as, say, the far that these communist uh, uh, murderers and dictators, or are they just, are they just, I mean, I don't know. Are they, can they be this ideologically? Uh, Driven or are they stupid? I mean, I'm for the latter. I think they're just really not incompetent. You have I think to be they're ignorant. stupid. What do you think? There's no that? way you could actually know what Che Guevara did and support them. They have to be ignorant of the record. But you have to be evil. But they lay claim to be. The, they lay claim to be these crusaders of minorities and those disenfranchised people. It's Yet here they have this guy who was killing, you know, was killing a family members in front of other family members. Yeah. He racist, homophobic, you, you name it. Yeah, no. I mean, I thought they were the, they were the crusaders of both. No, honestly, if you look at like like statistics on like my minority improvement economically, like in terms of unemployment and income growth during Reagan versus like that of whites, it was actually superior for minorities. And actually, if you look historically at the gender wage gap during uh, presidential administration, uh, it's actually shrunk faster under Republicans than it has under Democrats. So, regardless mm -hmm. of what parties claims to be for. Uh, I and mean, then we should the numbers, and aside from that, they may claim to be for social justice, so, but they're certainly not. Are you saying that intentions don't mean anything, Matt? That is crazy. Uh, I'm going to go out and say that, um, Will. Okay. Are you, Michael, do you agree that intentions mean little in policy? Like, if I intend to do good things and it has the absolute negative effect, that doesn't really matter the effect. It only matters that I meant to do good. I meant to do something, some, some discernible good, right? I think uh, I think Friedman kind of put that that logic to bed. 
uh, several times. So, I, and I think you know, Friedman thought that judging policies by their intentions right. was a, a grave mistake. I guess we, I, I think we've all heard the, uh, you know, the aphorism that all, you know, uh, the road to hell is, is paved with good intentions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Let me see. We have a qu- another question. It's by it's Brendan Conlon again. Um, another great question, which isn't a question, it's a statement. It says, Matt, I'm still waiting on that research paper. And uh, I know, Matt, you're going to be waiting an awfully long time for that paper. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, last episode I agreed to write this kid a research paper, and uh, can't say I remember to write it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you probably never will. Uh, it was a zero you know? chance it's getting written. Right. Yeah. Here's a question I want to get. Whoa, zero. There's another from Taco Salad, which is a great name, by the way. And I don't know anything about John Legend's remarks. I don't know if he's. I don't. I mean, he must know. He I just said know something about shitty music. black voters. Yeah, yeah, he said something about. What do you think about John Legend's remarks about black voter suppression? I think all of me. Um, hates all of him. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> John Legend. I love the guy's. I love his music. Talented guy. Um, oh, I and he's really a good role model. I think he's a good role model. He's a good look, good guy. Has a wife. He's not the. Uh, He's not out doing nefarious things, from what I know, or he doesn't get caught doing them, at least, which is which is pretty good. We just care. But I don't see. I mean, I want to know about John. His, I mean, where does there is there any evidence of black voter suppression? And if there was, couldn't they sue? I mean, isn't there? They have an option to actually to sue uh, individually or so on and so forth. The one part of voter suppression I did see is the Black Panthers standing outside of voting booths that. Nobody ever seemed to care about. Certainly not the Civil Rights Department and the Obama administration seemed to care. But do you think it's prevalent that there's black voter suppression, Matt? Or is it, um, maybe he's talking about ID, I mean, getting a uh, voter ID, like having an ID easy. in order to vote. I don't know. What do you think, Matt? Ah, fuck lagging shit. I don't know. I oh, so I actually just lagged out. Can you uh, repeat the question? Yeah. Do you, what do you th- do? You think there's widespread black voter suppression? Do you know what he's talking about? Um, and I said, perhaps it might be voter ID he's talking about. What do yeah. you think? Um, I've seen the argument that voter ID will suppress the black vote. Um, I know Mark Levin has some rebuttal to that, but I haven't read it yet. Um, that's literally the only case I've, I've heard of, though, so I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's really right. cool. I've heard of it. Well, I mean, here's a, is it based on, like, why is it that I'm so capable to get a voter ID, yeah. but someone with a darker skin pigmentation isn't capable. I do think it's condescending to say that blacks are can't get IDs on their own. So yeah, I don't, I don't understand. I really don't understand that argument. Yeah, have an ID so we know that you're an American citizen and you're a vo- you're a registered voter. I, That's racist. Honestly, I don't know I how it, you draw that conclusion. I think in my wallet I have two, at least two different IDs, so I don't understand how hard it could be. I don't. Right. Like, what are the odds you don't have a driver's license, a passport, a birth certificate? Like it's absurd. A student ID. There's so many ways to, to get on that. an airplane. Yeah, you is getting on. Are airplanes or airlines racist? Um, you know, when you go to the is a DMV racist? They make you get it. And like, by the way, like because you, you can go to drive. DM, you can go to the DMV and get a photo ID that's not a license, it, and it'll probably take you. Well, it's DMV, well, so it'll take you three hours, but it, you can still do it. Right. Yeah. But if you but based on your skin pigmentation, you may not be able to. But I'm the racist. So, of course, I get it. I totally get it. The, the brain doesn't work as well, or so. I don't. Uh, this argument is like my, is mind-boggling. Again, it's all based on politics, and these people will tell you anything. It's racist, really. Show me the facts. How is it racist? Where? They just constantly make claims and come up with these these arguments. This verbal virtuosity kills me. I don't even know what they're talking. What do you think, Mike? Do you think voter IDs are racist? Well, I think it's. Well, I, I, no, I don't think voter ID is racist. I think. It kind of is trying to solve maybe a fake problem because I don't think there's any widespread yeah. corruption uh, in the elections. But, I mean, in any event, when we're talking about John Legend's remarks, yeah, I don't think it's that hard to get an ID. But, unfortunately, and this this isn't, you know, this isn't any fault of anybody but their own, the, what causes black voter suppression is black people not going to vote. Unfortunately, they are the least likely to go to the polls. And... and if you want to get if you if you want to get the black vote out, you have to educate black people on you know in poor neighborhoods and minority neighborhoods. Hey, you have to tell you, hey here's where your polls are. Here's where you have to go. Here's the date. Here's the times. Because unfortunately for them, 
they're statistically the least likely people to vote. Right. So, yeah, th that's the main suppression. Yeah, I don't think ID laws are racist inherently. I don't think it's that hard to get an ID. I think it solves a fake problem. Right. But if we want to solve black voter suppression, you know, make sure they know where they're supposed to go to vote because they statistically don't show up. Well, you, I mean, you basically, you basically in your explanation describe government in so many words, basically creating this perceived, you know, problem that really isn't there and then coming up with a government solution to a problem that doesn't really exist. I mean, that's their thing. Everything's a government solution, meaning look, let's take more power from the people. How do we do so? Let's blame the market. Blame anything other than the politician. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know. Our economic system's been built on that. But uh, let's see. Let's take another question, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Huh. <laughs> I like this one. Uh, hold on. Very. How useless. How useless is the UN? <laughs> Mike, you're in Europe. I don't know why that has to do anything with this question, but um, I just like to tell everybody that you're in Europe because that's weird. Um, what is how useless uh -huh. is the UN? I mean, if if asking me this question because I was in Europe. <laughs> Uh, was more applicable would be how useless is the EU or NATO. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the UN, I mean, <laughs> useless? I wouldn't say useless. We could debate whether it's beneficial to us to be part of it, but I wouldn't say the entity itself is completely useless. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think, Matt? Do you think the UN's useless? Do you think they have any of our interests at, you know, any of the Amer American interests at heart? Do you think they care about American interests? What do you think, Matty? He said he's lagging. Well, that's basically this very good descriptor of Maddie's life. He lags. He's lagging behind. Only two books at 20 or 13. I mean, you know, that's not that good. I, I mistakenly said 20. But <laughs> and he's gone. Sorry, Maddie. Don't hate me. Um, I mean, I just want to say again, watch our show. It's every Wednesday at at 7 uh, p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific time. That's uh, I think what time is that? That's new, that's midnight in uh, in Belgium, right? Isn't that right, Mike? Yeah. That's that's 1 a.m. Central European time. 1 a.m. Central European time. Um, I'm glad. Yeah, but in a month I'm about to be back in Eastern time. I'm proud to announce you're coming back to the to the states. I'm sure you're happy about that. You know, big trucks and big bigger things. I don't know. I've really never been over there, but I know. The food? The, what do you, you the, what do you eat? A lot of Danishes and I don't know tea. Uh, the uh, the Belgians eat more fried food than we do, so I eat a lot of fried oh. food. Are they all are they all heavy set? No, they're way skinnier than us. I don't know how they do uh, it. Maybe they're, perhaps their government should probably ban the uh, the fried foods, or is that just New York City? Maybe. Oh. I mean that's. Uh, I mean, they probably should. The government needs to take care of the people do, here. Do they? I hope they've banned salt on tables by now. I'm concerned. <laughs> they might. That might be their next step. I mean, I hope, yeah, because I think you should maybe bring that up around there because that's pretty dangerous to have salt out on the table. That I mean, this is the purpose of government, to protect us from salt. Matt, are, are you still there? Maybe it's back, Tucker Salad. Yeah. I asked you a question and then I forgot what it was now because it was too long ago. But we were wrapping up and I just wanted to remind everybody up? to follow Being Liberal Logic. Uh, fuck, I guess we're wrapping up the show. Yeah. Um, follow Being Liberal Logic, the analytical conservative on Facebook, also Being Classically Liberal. Also follow We Are Capitalists. Um, am I missing? Oh, and Unbiased America, which I'm a new admin to and so is Matt Palumbo. Um, Michael Lee is the purveyor of, America. Of, being, of being liberal logic, and he's at being classically liberal. Thanks for coming. And uh, next week, next week we'll have a we'll have a special guest on, and it's a woman. So, and she's really pretty. So you can tune in for that. And uh, the week after, we will have um, Austin Peterson on. So it'll be interesting to ask him a ton of questions. But thanks for watching, and we will talk to you guys soon. Have a good day, night slash life.